wouldn't know that Forgiving all about hell in paradise Worshipping cows, fire and stones Selling the best with the cheapest price So why did they ignore that? Forgetting all about hell and paradise Worshipping cows, fire and stones Selling their best with the cheapest price السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم. All praises due to Allah. We praise him and we seek his help. Whomsoever Allah guides is a fully guided one, and whomsoever Allah leaves us say, none can show him guidance. I bear witness that there is no God worthy of worship but the Almighty Allah alone and I bear witness that Muhammad, peace be upon him, is his last messenger. My dear viewers, welcome to another live edition of our program, Gardens of the Pious. And today's episode is number 502 in the series of Riyadh al-Salihin by Imam Nawawi. May Allah have mercy on him. Uh, and it will be the 12th episode in the same chapter, chapter number 234, or the obligation of observing uh, jihad. And uh, the first hadith that we're going to study today is a very interesting hadith that delivers uh, such glad tiding. It is collected by Imam Turmidhi in his Sunan. And the narrator is Abdullah ibn Abbas. May Allah be pleased with him. That is hadith number 1305. 1305. An ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu in this hadith, the Messenger of Allah, peace be upon him, said, There are two eyes which will never be touched by the fire of hell, an eye which weeps out of fear of Allah, and an eye which spends the night in garden in the cause of Allah. Uh, this hadith mentioned a combination of two great traits. The first, is the quality of being God-fearing and doing self-assessment, self-reckoning. So the person ends up regretting what he or she have done in the past, as it is also recommended by the Prophet ﷺ said, ibki ala khati'atik, you should cry for your sin. Crying is a sign of sincere repentance. So a person who happened to shed tears out of the fear of Allah, this is a very praiseworthy practice. Crying and shedding tears out of the fear of Allah, which indicates that person's heart is alive and that person is sincere in his or her repentance. As it is also mentioned in the hadith of سَبْعَةٌ يُظِلُّهُمُ اللَّهُ فِي ظِلِّهِ يَوْمَ لَا ظِلَّ إِلَّا ظِلُّهُ The seven categories of people who will be sheltered by the Almighty Allah on the day of judgment when there will not be any shade but His. He mentioned among those seven categories a man whom as the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said ذَكَرَ اللَّهَ خَالِيًا فَفَاضَتْ عَيْنَاهِ Khaliyan means in private, in solitude, a person who sitting by himself. Uh, so he remembered Allah, he remembered his greatness, he remembered life after death, he remembered his own sins and misdoings, and he remembered how Allah the Almighty is able to do all things and he may punish him and if he doesn't have mercy on him, he will be ruined. So that shocked him and resulted in crying. فَفَاضَتْ عَيْنَا يعني His eyes overflow with tears. 
And in this hadith, عَيْنٌ بَكَتْ مِنْ خَشْيَةِ اللَّهِ An eye which shed tears out of the fear of Allah. عَيْنٌ بَكَتْ مِنْ خَشْيَةِ اللَّهِ So it was not mentioned only in this hadith, rather it was emphasized. When uh, the Prophet ﷺ mentioned that on the Day of Judgment, when there will not be any shade and the sun will draw very near and some people will be drowned in the sweat and some people the sweat will be up to their noses uh, a huge suffering a great deal of suffering yet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to spare certain people out of that some people out of those seven categories will be spared because of their good intent yani uh, the person who remembered Allah in private all what he did is as a result of remembering Allah in private he shed tears and here he says the two people whom far of hell will never touch them the first one is a person whose eyes shed tears min khashyatillah out of the fear of Allah obviously when the Prophet sallallahu says aynan two eyes it refers to the eyes of that person that particular person who will do and execute the following advice command or recommendation shedding tears out of the fear of Allah is such a praiseworthy act some people say hey men do not cry <laughs> That is not true. Men cry when they get emotional. Men cry uh, when they lose a loved one. Men cry for their sins. Men like women. The Prophet ﷺ cried when he saw, uh, you know, his uh, grandson being dying uh, between his hands. So they said, Ya Rasulullah, you cry. And he said, Yes, this is mercy. Allah puts it in the heart of whoever He wills. And when he lost his son, Ibrahim, he was his only son, he cried. And he said, what? Yeah, indeed, the eyes are shedding tears, but the tongue doesn't say, but what pleases the Lord, you see? So we, we, we cry as well, no problem. This is not a sign of weakness. It depends on what you're crying and why you're crying. Sometimes a person pretends crying. There are actors and actresses while playing the role, they, they pretend to cry that doesn't count we're not talking about this kind of crying and that's why the Prophet وسلم, in the earlier hadith said Rajulun khaliyan fafadat he remembered Allah in private no one was watching so that the amount of sincerity is full is absolute you know you may cry like everybody else is crying whenever we're praying taraweeh or in the masjid or the imam is reciting an ayah which touched the hearts of most of the followers so everybody is crying some people don't even know the meaning and they just join the crowd and they cry now we're talking about a particular type of crying you know why you're crying and whom are you hoping out of crying that he will have mercy on you and will pardon you an eye that shed tears out of fear of Allah and رَجُلٌ ذَكَرَ اللَّهَ خَالِيًا فَفَاضَتْ عَيْنَا a man who remembered Allah in private so his eyes overflow with tears that is the first quality in this hadith the second quality عَيْنٌ بَاتَتْ تَحْرُسُ فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ so the second person and the second, the second category of people whom far of hell will never touch on the day of judgment is a person who is guarding the people while they are asleep he is working for the cops working for the military working on the border control in order to guard people so that people will sleep and they're safe and sound because we have a strong military, we have a strong army, we have people who are awake. They will not lie down. They will not jeopardize our safety. 
We're talking about Muslims who are doing that for the sake of Allah. Believers who are doing so for the sake of Allah. If this is the case, then this person also who sacrificed the comfort of his bed. He could be working any other job, making some good living, living with his family. But we need you on the borders. We need you on the front line. So he is there to defend the people who will be either asleep or praying at night, reciting or making dua at night. So because of him guarding that post, you feel safe and sound. And that's why you either rested in comfort or you started offering your prayer with peace because you know that you are being protected. So because of him, you've been given this opportunity and this chance. You feel safe and secure. So no reward on earth would compensate this person. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, far of hell is forbidden to touch the flesh of that person. Alhamdulillah. Such good news. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the opportunity to serve him and serve his deen by any of those means. Because you see, brothers and sisters, we have many chances to be among them. When the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam said about the seven categories of people who will be sheltered uh, on the day of judgment from the heat of the sun under a shade which Allah creates exclusively for such people. When he says, Rajul, ذكر الله خاليا it covers both man and woman young and old and he's doing this he's a believer and he's doing this out of the fear of Allah how many times it doesn't say because it is not required to be multiple times if that is fulfilled once you fit the criterion you're in alhamdulillah so try to do that give yourself the opportunity perhaps to get up at night to pray to rakas and in your sujood you beg Allah for forgiveness and you try to remember how many bad things you've done and how merciful Allah is with you. He didn't expose your uh, faults. He didn't put you in a scandal. Rather, he's concealing your sins and he's so merciful to you. So as a result, you shed tears and you beg Allah for forgiveness. You're in, alhamdulillah. You're in. If ala khati'atik, one day you've committed a big, uh, mistake a bad deed or whatever so you're asking Allah to forgive it and uh, one of the means of achieving this forgiveness is as the Prophet Sallallahu said crying for your sin crying because at, at a weak point you forgot that Allah is watching you and you indulge in the sin so you're asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to remit that sin to overlook it that too is such a praiseworthy act the other is being a guard to guard the borders and the Muslims while they are asleep. The second uh, hadith in today's episode is hadith number 1306. An Zayd ibn Khalid radiyallahu anhu anna Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam qal man jahaza ghaziyan fi sabilillahi faqad ghaza ومن خالف غازيا في أهله بخير فقد غزا متفق عليه. So first of all, this hadith is highly authentic. It is collected by the two great imams, Bukhari and Muslims. Narrated by Zayd ibn Khalid, may Allah be pleased with him. He reported that the messenger of Allah, peace be upon him, said, He who equips and prepares a mujahid, a ghazi, a fighter, somebody a Muslim in the Muslim army in the way of Allah he is as if he has taken part in the fighting himself as if he had traveled to the battlefield and encountered all the hardship and difficulties and he who looks after the dependence of a Mujahid or a Ghazi in his absence is as if he has taken part in the fighting himself okay MashaAllah, good news. Why? Because we know that not everyone can afford physically to join the army. At the time of the Prophet Sallallahu everybody wanted to go. Uh, Amr ibn al-Jamuh would come and he wants to join. But you have disability. 
you're exempt. No, please, I want to enter paradise with my limping leg. Abdullah ibn Umay ibn Maktoum. Abdullah ibn Umm Maktoum was blind and he insists, I want to join the Muslim army. What are you going to do? He says, just give me the banner. Since I'm blind, it will not make any difference. It will not scare me off when I see the enemies are marching forth towards me. I'm not going to run off because I'm blind. So he carries the banner in the middle of the battle. Uh, and many cases, uh, Mu'adh and Ma'ud, two youth, they came to join the uh, army and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, you're too young. Um, other companions, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam literally rejected them because they're too young. Everybody wants to. In the previous episode we said, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, you know, if it is up to me, I wouldn't miss a single expedition or any battle. But out of mercy on my followers, because if the companions were to see the Prophet ﷺ join in this expedition, no one will be left behind. But we have to have to manage our business, to take care of our daily affairs. And we don't want any, everyone, we just need a group of people. It's a small expedition. Or this uh, troop can take care of this battle. We don't want everyone. So those who stay behind, and they assist the army or anyone in the army, in the Muslim army, um, financially or physically. Financially, who says, you know what? How much were you making? Okay, whatever you were making as you were working, whenever you're gone, I will deliver it to your family. A, a neighbor says to his neighbor who's enrolled in the Muslim army, all your needs are on me. Your family, I'm going to rob your kids to school. If they need anything, go to the hospital, here or there, I'm going to be their driver. He's looking after the independent of the Ghazi or the fighter. Without the help of those people, the army wouldn't set out. You know, if they go for six months, for eight months, for a year, who's looking after the family? Who's putting, putting bread on the table for them? Who's feeding them? Who's making certain that if any of them gets sick, that they will rush, rush them to the hospital or buy the food and the clothing for them. I'm taking care of them for that person or that person. So the Prophet ﷺ says, a person who takes care of a ghazi financially or looks after his independent. Whenever he is gone, they are similar in their word. He receives a similar word to the fighter himself even though he did not set a foot outside his town. That is because of the fact that the Prophet ﷺ said, الدَّالُّ عَلَى الْخَيْرِ كَفَاعِلِهِ You know, in America, every time whenever we are boarding the flight, whether it is domestic flight uh, or international flight, they announce the boarding. And once they open the boarding, they say, now we welcome our patriot, army, personnel, military, whatever, because you know somebody is wearing the uniform. Oh, okay, even before first class and business class. And then people cheer and clap and you know why? Because this soldier is in the army, even though he chose to be in the army, it is not obligatory because mm, for a reason or another, I get paid. I have uh, full medical uh, coverage, uh, I have retirement, uh, I can continue my education for free, the army or the military, the navy or the marines will pay for me. I have some uh, privileges, so not necessarily that because I'm patriotic, but I join the army, it's like a job. So Muslims are more worthy than anybody else to honor their mujahideen, to look after their family members, to look after their independence whenever they are gone and to assist them financially because they're sacrificing uh, their time uh, and time means money and not only they're sacrificing their time and money they are sacrificing the comfort of being with their family and they are sacrificing their comfort zone and they are sacrificing perhaps their lives as well so when you come forward and you assist them when you look after their independence, 
you take care of them as your, your family exactly, Allah the Almighty will give you the same reward like the Ghazi. You are in, you are limping, have some disability, but you have means. You can afford it financially. So you look after somebody who left to support you and protect your borders and defend you against the attacks of your enemy. That is the meaning of من جهز غازيا في سبيل الله فقد غزا ومن خلف غازيا في أهله بخير فقد غزا That's why the following hadith will explain further It's not necessarily that you have to يعني do 24-7 or full coverage the financial coverage but depending on how much you can afford The following hadith hadith number 1307 عن أبي أمامة رضي الله عنه قال قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم أفضل الصدقات ظل فسطاط في سبيل الله ومنيحة خادم في سبيل الله أو طروقة فحل في سبيل الله The hadith is collected by Imam Tirmidhi So Abu Umama may Allah be pleased with him narrated that the messenger of Allah peace be upon him said the best of charities is to provide canopy in the cause of Allah. Wow. To pay wages to a servant in the way of Allah. And to provide a camel in the way of Allah to be used by a mujahid. Oh, well, the English meaning is very superficial, by the way. He's not really giving in depth the meaning of the hadith. Okay. So the Prophet said, the best, not among the best, rather أفضل الصدقات The best of charities is one of the following ظل فسطاط في سبيل الله الفسطاط means the canopy or the huge tent The military and the army when they travel they do not stay in houses constructed of concrete they take tents with them, canopies so who bought it? Who paid for it? Somebody donated it. This is one of the best charities ever. Okay? Better than providing a shelter for the poor. Because a lot of people would do that. But the army sitting in the middle of nowhere. They need a canopy to protect them from the heat of the sun. I donated that. This is one of the best charities. The second. When this person left and he joined the army, he's fighting on the front line to protect our lives and he's putting his life at the risk in order to protect us and to protect Muslims and the civilians. This person needs and deserves to be rewarded. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed me with some wealth. So I sent my driver, I said, you know what? As long as this officer is in the army, you work for them. I pay you. You take the car and you take them around. You drop their kids to school. You buy them the supplies, the uh, whatever. You take them uh, here and there and shopping. You are working for them, but I pay you. That is maniha to khadim. To hire, al maniha could be either by giving away or by lending. So if you give it for some time until the person returns, that's maniha. And that is also appreciated by Allah. And this is, it, it does count among the best of charities. And if you say, you know, lifetime, your maid is on me, your driver is on me, or the car and the vehicle is yours. Likewise, this is even better. If you can afford it, of course. And the third, the Prophet ﷺ said, أو طروقة فحلن. In English, you just say the camel. But the word taruqa to fahlin means a she camel which is grown up and ready to be impregnated by the fahla. The fahl is the male camel. Okay? So it's a fit she camel. Okay? We need it for what? We need it for milk. Okay? Or to ride its back. We need it for meat after, you know, we don't need the milk anymore. So this way, the people, either the family of the Mujahid or the Mujahid himself or the army would need these 
she camels, the tents, the canopies, the help, any kind of help, any sort of help, as long as it is to support the army, support the Muslim army, or the families of the soldiers and the officers who are enrolled in the army, all of that counts among the best of charities. أَفْضَلُ الصَّدَقَاتِ ظِلُّ فُسْطَاطٍ What? فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ In the way of Allah. مَنِيحَةُ قَادِمٍ فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ To give a maid, a driver or a help for that person who is in the army or for his family whenever they are gone. أَوْ طَرُوقَةُ فَحْلٍ فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ Or to give a she camel and we learn the meaning of طَرُوقَةُ فَحْلٍ exactly provided it is in the way of Allah to be used by the Mujahid. Brothers and sisters, it's time to take a short break and inshallah we'll be back in a few minutes for some more. Please stay tuned. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed the Quran in seven different ways of recitation. Similarly, Maryam alayhi salam, she's a woman by herself. She doesn't even have a husband who's ever touched her. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala granted a child to Maryam alayhi salam. Look at that. She said that, how will I have a child? How will I have a child whilst I've never even been touched by a man? One of the unique things about the story is that it's not like Umar al-Khattab hasn't heard these verses. Can you imagine that Umar al-Khattab hasn't heard these verses? He became sick from the effect that this ayah ended up having on his, on his mind at that moment. Our Prophet Muhammad is La ilaha illallah, is to carry the meaning of the word La ilaha illallah to everyone, to all the people who are around him, right. as many people as he can. So, this is the mission. Mention is needed by everybody. Tell me about a person in this world who does not need mercy. Hmm. Mercy is a key way of or course. a key word for healing the hearts of human beings. And what happens is they get so many rejections that they feel so bad about themselves. They don't know that what's been rejected now is your current skills, your current experience, which by time and effort can develop. You are looking for another job, but temporarily you are going to, you are doing this job, so perfect it. And this is part of our great religion, is mm. perfection. And perhaps mm. there is another chapter about this. Perfect right. your work. Give mm -hmm. the right to the job that you have. Because for example, on, on another note, if you are not positive, you cannot motivate. Absolutely. If you are not positive, you cannot recognize. You cannot even look for the good things. Subhanallah, Subhanallah. Jabir ibn Abdullah narrated, whenever we went up a place, we would say, Allahu Akbar, Allah is the greatest. And whenever we went down a place, we would say, Subhanallah, glory be to Allah. times that we are going through today where people are fighting with each other to establish superiority. Join me as we go through lessons from Surah Al-Hujrat. Allah, 
Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome back. Allow me to remind you with our uh, contact information beginning with the phone numbers area code 002 then 023855132 alternatively area code 002 then 01005469323 WhatsApp numbers area code 001 347 finally area code 001 361 Four eight nine one five zero three, and the uh, WhatsApp uh, numbers uh, were the last numbers. Then the Facebook page is M Salah Official. You can also watch us uh, on the YouTube channel, uh, Dr. Muhammad Salah. Uh, Abdul Aziz from Kenya. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I have three questions. Go ahead, brother Abdul Aziz. Hello? Please go ahead, Abdul Aziz. Okay, the first question is, if your father is not praying and he's got bad habits, and you constantly remind him to stay away from haram and do what is pleasing to Allah as a wajil, but he doesn't listen, is it wrong to distance yourself from or prayer that he might bring your iman down and he might start picking up bad habits? A second question is, I'm seeing certain brothers and their names think the Nabi, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, they say our master, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Is that wrong? And the, and the third question is, in the masjid, for Salat al-Makhrib, the sheikh read two surahs, and then he ended it with al-ikhlas. Is that correct or is that halad? Okay. Thank you, Abdul Aziz from Kenya. With regards to advising one's father who is doing a lot of misdoing, one still must understand that he is his father. Even if the father not only doing or committing sins, even if he is a non-believer. And remember how Ibrahim السلام, used to constantly and kindly advise his father by saying, Ya Abati, Ya Abati, La ta'bud shaytan My beloved father. That is the meaning of the word Ya Abati in Arabic. My beloved father even though his father was a mushrik or he used to worship idols and he opposed him and he opposed his mission and he supported those who decided to burn Ibrahim alayhi salam. The Almighty Allah says even if they were the, the, the parents, even if they were disbelievers, he said وَصَاحِبْهُمَا فِي الدُّنْيَا مَعْرُوفًا So being kind to them under any circumstances whether they are good or bad, Muslims or non-Muslims, believers or wicked uh, the second paying them the constant advice you have to modify the way and change the way you, you're given the advice okay not necessarily every time you bombard them with the same way where you know the result will be uh, the same so sometimes you bring some guests at home maybe it's not working from you you bring guests at home and it happens a lot Sometimes people say, can you visit my dad? And I visit. He say, I like that man. You know, he's funny. Uh, he's cool. And um, maybe your son is better. But this is how it is. So through somebody else, it may help. Okay. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Fairuz from the UK. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, brother Salah, how are you? Alhamdulillah, how are you sister? Welcome to the program. Thank you so much. It's lovely to see you every time. Whenever I get time, I see this program. Thank so basically, you. I have two questions today. Mm -hmm. uh, the first one is... Uh, sorry? Go ahead, I'm listening. Shall I carry on? Yeah. So basically, um, I, I give you just one scenario. One day I was praying in the mosque, and uh, I was praying like for Sunnah or for Dha, and uh, this Azan, sorry, the the Jamaat starts. So Jamaat start, and somebody said to me um, after when I finished because I couldn't join the Jamaat because I was praying Sunnah. So after my pray, I start Jamaat. You know, I joined the Jamaat, but somebody said to me there that you should have break your four sunnah and join the Jamaat straight away as soon as it starts. So I was confused about it. So first, I, uh, if you just clarify this question for me. And the second one is, 
uh, if I join the jamaat and I, I join from the second raka, so second raka they sit for the shahud. So in that case, if it, as it if it is first raka, do I have to sit for the shahud as well? And the last one, I mean, do I do three the shahud? I mean. So I hope you understand my question. Yes, I do. I got both of them. Uh, okay, great. Okay. Zana alaikum. Thank you, sister. Assalamu alaikum. Sama from Algeria. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome to the program. Salam. Can you hear me? Sister Samah, can you hear me? Go ahead. Uh, I can talk now. Yes. Yes, yes, I can. Uh, I want to ask you, ask you if I can make my salah and hold my baby at the same time, because my baby is very small, and every time I make my prayer, he cry much. So I have to make my prayer and hold my baby at the same time. Okay. Do you have another and question? I want to ask. Uh, mm. Yes, yes, I have. I have more question. I want to ask if I can cut my eyebrow, my eyebrow, because if I am a convert, I am Brazilian, and I'm convert, and before I always make my eyebrow. Okay. But, uh, but now I stop. When I convert to Islam, I stop to cut to to make. But my my eyebrow grow a lot. Mm. So I always feel like I, I have to cut because because I make b before so he don't stop grow he grow a lot so I always have to cut to cut. Okay, got your questions, Sister Samah from Algeria, and uh, since we're having a call from Algeria, you know, mashallah, uh, uh, Algerians also some of them their second language uh, is Eng is French and some their second uh, first language is, is French. So I want to share the good news with you, alhamdulillah, um, a month and a half ago, six weeks ago, we started our electronic da'wah, and uh, mashallah, the good news, we have approximately 300 new Muslims in English. Then we started a couple weeks ago, the French electronic, I'm sorry, the Spanish electronic da'wah, and we have, mashallah, close to 50 new Muslims from Latin America and so on. So we are highly encouraged and motivated to start a new uh, platform to give da'wah in French. So French speakers are most welcome to sign up with us as volunteers and we'll train you inshallah to be given da'wah in French, inshallah. So if you think yourself you're good in French, please sign up. You can send me a message here. We'll take your name and we'll walk you through inshallah and uh, we'll enroll you in courses to learn how to give da'wah through our platform in French. Only French speakers or those who believe that they can give da'wah in French are most welcome for the time being to sign up for the new electronic uh, platform uh, da'wah in French. Uh, you can send uh, your requests uh, right now in the comment bar if you're watching me on the Facebook page uh, M. Salah official or on the YouTube channel. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Abdul Rahman from Cyprus. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Go ahead. Yes, um, I'm, I'm, from, I'm from Africa. Um, wa alaikum salam. I, I said my question is um, I'm from Africa and uh, where I'm from. My name is Abdurrahman. My name is Abdurrahman. Okay. Yeah, I said my question is um, I'm from Africa and where I'm from, I'm, I used to pray in mocks in the masjid and here in, in, in Europe, um, I, don't, I, don't, I don't see mocks. I don't see masjids where I am and especially during Juma, I don't know how to pray Juma, you know. Juma, should I pray Zur? Okay. Yeah, I'm getting you. Okay. Okay, thank you, Abdurrahman from Cyprus. And inshallah, I will answer you shortly. 
السلام عليكم محمد from the USA and let's uh, take this the last call إن شاء الله in order to be able to answer your pending questions محمد from the USA السلام عليكم Brother Muhammad, okay. Um, Abdul Aziz from Kenya, his second question was, some people when they mention the name of Prophet Muhammad وسلم, they introduce it by saying our master. Is there anything wrong with that? No, there is nothing wrong with that. Saying Sayyidina Muhammad or Sayyiduna Muhammad وسلم, is perfectly fine. And he's our master in the dunya and he will be our master in the hereafter. Only whenever you are saying his name in the recitation of Quran, you recite it as is. And in the Adhan, you recite it as is. And in the Tashahud, in the prayer, you recite it as is, without adding the word Sayyidina. But after the prayer, outside the recitation of Quran, I say, Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad. That is perfectly fine. When I quote a hadith and say, Sayyiduna Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, that is perfectly fine as well. In the tashahud and salah, I say, Ashadu an la ilaha illallah wa anna muhammadan rasulullah. I stick to the text, okay? In the adhan, likewise. In the Quran, when I read an ayah which says, Muhammadur rasulullah, I don't add Sayyiduna because that is a Quran. I stick to what is mentioned in it. Okay, the Imam who recites whatever surah then after all, he recites surah al-Ikhlas, is this valid? Yes, that is valid. And that was uh, practiced by one of the companions who used to lead the companions at the time of the Prophet Sallallahu and when he asked him, why do you do that? He said, because I love it. So the Prophet Sallallahu said, well indeed Allah loves you as well because you love this surah, surah al-Ikhlas. Our sister Fairuz from the United Kingdom said that when she was in the masjid and she was praying the four rak'ah sunnah and the iqamah was called. What happens whenever you're praying the sunnah and then you hear the iqamah in the masjid? In the hadith, the Prophet ﷺ guided us and walked us through in a situation like that. He said, إِذَا أُقِيمَةُ الصَّلَاةِ فَلَا صَلَاةَ إِلَّا الْمَكْتُوبَةِ Whenever the iqamah for the mandatory prayer is been called, then you shouldn't be praying anything else. What about if I was in the last rak'ah and I just need to finish, and by the time the iqamah is finished and the imam starts the prayer, I would finish my sunnah. In this case, it is okay. I just started though, and I think if I were to continue with my sunnah, I will miss the first rak'ah with the imam. Then it's not permissible to continue with your sunnah. You should leave immediately and then join the jama'ah. Okay? Uh, when you, uh, her second question is concerning a person who joined the prayer late and she gave an example of the Maghrib prayer for innocence. She joined in the second rak'ah, so she prayed with the Imam one tashahud. And then the second, uh, the, the second rak'ah for her, which will be the third for the Imam, he will also sit again for tashahud. And then by the end you will sit for your own rak'ah with the end of the prayer, so you will be praying three roods or three tashahud, three sittings. Is that correct? Yes, perfectly correct. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said in the hadith, إِنَّمَا جُعِلَ الْإِمَامُ لِيُؤْتَمَّ بِهِ Well, basically the Imam was appointed to be followed. So if he makes sujood, he makes sujood. If he makes tashahud, he makes tashahud. Then when you join the Imam, whether it is his first or second or third rak'ah, that is your first. Okay, regardless which rak'ah is it for the Imam. So when the Imam says, Assalamu alaikum, you resume your prayer as if you started, uh, you know, your first rak'ah with the Imam is your first rak'ah when you started the prayer. So you prayed with the Imam two rak'ahs for innocence. Okay? Then the Imam makes salam. And when you get up, you say, Allahu Akbar, and you resume. You'd only pray Surah Al-Fatiha while standing, no other surah, because that is your third and your fourth rak'ah. Let's say that the sister joined the Imam in the second rak'ah in Maghrib. So, second rak'ah. Now you get up to pray your own second rak'ah. Okay? You recite Fatiha and another surah. It is recommended. Because you follow your own order. Sister 
Samah from Algeria, she's a revert. May the Almighty Allah keep you firm and steadfast on his straight path. Can I pray while carrying my baby because the baby cries a lot, newborn? Yes, you can. No problem. And the Prophet ﷺ used to pray while bearing and carrying Umama bin Taras, his granddaughter. And whenever he would make ruku or sujood, he would put her on the floor. Then whenever he stands up, he carries her again. Okay? So if it is possible or feasible to put your child in a baby seat or in a stroller in front of you, next to you while praying, that is okay. But if the baby does not stop crying while praying, carry the baby and that does not affect your prayer. It is okay. Your second question with regards to blocking the eyebrows. No, that is not permissible, Sister Samah. I know that a lot of people do it. And since you're a revert, some people, uh, whether men or women, but it's more common in women, they shave completely their eyebrows and then they draw it. That is not permissible in Islam. Allah created you beautiful. Do not change the creation of Allah. And I bet you your husband is very happy with you like that. So in Islam, you don't do that. Um, Abdul Rahman from Cyprus, that uh, when he came to Cyprus, he doesn't have a mosque. He cannot even pray Jumu'ah. If you don't have any Muslims around you, then you're exempt from the congregational prayer and from the Jumu'ah prayer. But if you know that there is or there are few Muslims, then offer the Jumu'ah, get together. One of you gives a khutbah, praises Allah, recites an ayah of the Quran, reminds the audience. You can even get together in one place or rent a place on Friday, a room here or there in order to benefit of this congregation. This is really important. And uh, this is a message for our brothers and sisters who are dreaming of traveling here and there to some countries. Uh, they think that the green, as they say, the grass always or looks always greener on the other side. When you get there, you miss everything. You feel like you are detained in your apartment, in your, in your studio, between work and uh, going to sleep, and that's it. Life is very tough. If you are, alhamdulillah, living in a Muslim society where you can hear the adhan and you can function as a Muslim and you're earning your living, even if it is barely enough for you, that is definitely better for you. May Allah guide all of us to what is best to be continued, inshallah, next time, my dear brothers and sisters. I ask the Almighty Allah to pardon us all, forgive us all our sins, and to guide us to what is best. أقول قولي هذا وأستغفر الله لي ولكم وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. To him, he wanted humans to be the best and give his best religion to them. So why did they ignore that? Forgetting all about him in paradise, worshipping cows, fire and stones, selling the best with the cheapest price. So why did they ignore that? Forgetting all about hell and paradise, worshipping cows, fire and stones. Selling their best with the cheapest price.